if you haven't had a chance, pick up a bulletin. There's, uh, I, I guess the news, most of it's something that you already know about in there. I know we did have a, uh, I don't know if there's a Noah's Ark and the flood event down the hall with the younger classes, and we're just going to have to bear with that disruption for, uh, I think Mark said maybe next Sunday we'll be back in, back in shape where we're supposed to be. But, before we get started, are there any uh, prayer requests? I know Chuck's out, to, <coughs> Chuck's out today with the flu, and I know that's going around, so as Kay, Kay always tells me, keep your hands below your neck, so that way you don't get it. But let's, uh, let's have a quick prayer before we get started. Holy Father, we're certainly thankful for all that you've given us for what you've given us here spiritually and also what you've given us physically on this earth. We are thankful that we do have a warm place to come together and, and meet together to learn about you and learn about your son. And we do pray for all those that are teaching today that, uh, that they not just here at your uh, congregation that meets here, but uh, throughout the world that, that the truth is spread uh, and, and we do justice to your word. We, we do pray for those that are sick and not able to be with us, certainly be with Chuck and, and his family as, as he's going through the flu, and we do pray that, that uh, none, none others are, uh, or that we're all able to, to keep that from happening to the, to the rest of us. We are thankful that the, that the damage that we've had down the hall was not any worse than it was, and thankful for all those that, that took care of that. Again, we're so thankful for your son, and it is through his name that we ask this prayer. Amen. Uh, we're starting on uh, Matthew chapter 17 this morning. I've already been chastised for the font size of the, of the first one. I told him, he, I was told that that was just a waste of the electrons to, to put it up on the screen. So I apologize for that. You, you can follow along in your Bible. In the first part of it, we'll read uh, through chapter, or through verse 13. This will be uh, Matthew chapter 17. It's, it's about the transfiguration. You know, as we, we left off last week, uh, when, when uh, well, Peter had, had uh, chastised Christ before he, you know, when he told him that he was going to be you know, t taken up and for th uh, three days and, and, then, and then raised again. And he, he, you know, Peter, he had the keys to the kingdom, and that was not in his vocabulary. I think Mr. Prince pointed that out last week, that a lot of times we don't, we don't, uh, we, we try to fit things to our, to what we expect, and that's what Peter was doing. And you'll see uh, one commentary that I was reading, and I don't even know where I got it, but he was talking about, uh, Peter was chastised by, you know, Jesus and by God in, in, in a period of less than a week, and, and you'll see that here in this account of the transfiguration. <laughs> but let's read uh, Matthew 17, verses 1 through 13. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now when they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they will not know him, 
but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. You know, if you read Luke's account of this, of this, that uh, he he talked about there was uh, now it came to pass as in Luke nine verse twenty eight, first part of that verse. Now it came to pass about eight days after those saying, and some people say that's a contradiction in the Bible, but as we know, sometimes partial days were accounted as a possibility of what what uh, of what Luke was was doing was doing there. The uh, and, and Luke also includes that Jesus and his disciples went up on the mountain to pray. Uh, why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John? Deuteronomy uh, 19, verse 15, it, it says there, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any inquiry or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So Jesus was carrying with him, he was carrying three witnesses. He wasn't. Carrying, carrying just the two, he was carrying three, uh, and and he repeats this this uh, this saying in Deuteronomy about the two or three witnesses in in Matthew 18, which we'll get to next week, and and Second uh, Corinthians 13, one also repeats you know this Old Testament verse. So Jesus, it, it appears here that Jesus did he did want witnesses, and as we read through other passages in the Bible in, in John uh, 1 14 the end of that verse we have seen his glory uh, 2 Peter 1 16 we were eyewitnesses of his majesty so these it appears that they could be if they're and they may be talking about Jesus as a whole in these verses or they may be talking about this event here that they had seen the glory of Jesus and, and we're, we're not 100% certain, but it, it does appear that. Now, and he'll go on here and tell them not to not to reveal this until after his, his uh, resurrection. But it says they went up on a high mountain. A lot of commentaries will imply that that's Mount Tabor in Galilee, but the area that they were in, and we don't have an account of them leaving uh, the, the area that they were in, it, that mountain wouldn't have been there, and there was a fort up on that mountain at this time, so it, it probably was was not Mount Tabor. Uh, a lot of a lot of the commentaries think it was Mount Hermon. It was a higher mountain, and it would have been isolated. You know, a, after you know the the transfiguration, it says they departed from there, talking about the mountain, and and passed through Galilee. So this this. Uh, they were probably still in the in the area of Caesarea Philippi until after this transfiguration. The word transfiguration is a word that means uh, the the Greek word is metamorpho, and it's where we get our word metamorphosis. And, and you would see it, it, it would be like something. Well, it, you, you know, one of the things that we that we see that metamorphoses or metamorphosizes. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it would be the caterpillar you know, changing into a butterfly. And there's no comparison between the two. Caterpillars, in my opinion, are ugly. Butterflies are not. They're, they're beautiful. And this, this was a transfiguration that, uh, that Jesus went through. And that word appears only two other times in the New Testament. Of course, one of them is in Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And also one that we studied just recently that Chuck had brought out in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, you know, we're, we're also being transformed, you know, day by day into this same image same image uh, if we are if we are in the word and, and faithful and uh, faithful to uh, Christ and it says it says that Jesus's face shone like the sun and I can I cannot imagine you know if the UFO people were out there what they probably would have been reporting uh, was happening there was a bright light over in, in the mountains because if it was if it was shining like the sun I can only imagine what they what they would uh, what they would be 
reporting, his face became white as light, probably, and they said it was probably the light that was shining through his clothes. And John's description of Jesus in Revelation 1, verses 14 and 15, it says his, hair, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass if it were fined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. So I, I, I kind of think in John's mind, he had already had a sneak preview of what he's seeing in Revelation. Of course, he hadn't, hadn't seen him for, for 20, 30 years, but, but the, I, I can only imagine that he, that he flashed back to that. And Jesus was being seen in his divine form, no longer veiled by the human flesh. And remember that this, this event did happen at night. Um, and so it, w it couldn't have been any kind of a in any kind of a reflected light like we see. I know if you've been looking at the moon the last few nights, it's been it's been really bright. I think it's closer than it's than it usually is. It's probably at the closest that it, it, it is, and it's bright. But this could not have been the the uh, been what was happening in this in this account. It was not a, a reflected light. We know that Jesus is the light. He even mentions this. I won't read the verses. If you want to just jot them down and look them up. John 8, 12, uh, John 9, 5, and also in John 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And, and you know, we, we know that Jesus is the light. And, and uh, this was what was being shown. But there's two other men mentioned that are that are here with Jesus. The two men are uh, Moses and Elijah. certain how they knew, but the, the, these two men would, would have represented, Moses would have represented the law, and Elijah would have uh, represented the prophets. And the law and the prophets were all that they had until now. Uh, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, since the time the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing, and that word means using force, into it. Uh, you know, they, they, they were wanting to take Jesus at that time and, and to make him king. There's a parallel verse to that in John verse 6, uh, or John chapter 6, verse 15. But, uh, you know, these, these two men, Moses and Elijah, they realized that, that what, uh, uh, what was about to happen, really the law and the prophets depended on what was, what was about to happen. And, and you know, they were talking about Jesus' death. In Luke 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 31, the, the parallel account of this verse, it says that they were speaking of his decease, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they were, they were speaking about Jesus and, and, and what he had to do and what he was going to accomplish. And as they were about to depart, of course, Paul had to, he just had to speak up. And in Luke's account, going back to it again, in Luke uh, 9.33, you know, it, it, it uh, gives an emphasis there that, that Peter was not knowing what he said. And he, what he said was, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And what uh, a lot of people, a lot of commentators, they talk about what was going on here was was Paul was putting them all on the same level. So he, he really did not know what he was saying. Uh, Franklin Camp and his, some of his books, he talks about the, the law and the prophets depend on the cross. And you can, we can read about that in, in uh, later chapters. And, and it's, uh, well, Acts 13, verse 38 and 39. Uh, Therefore, let it be, this is, this is Paul uh, speaking here. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that though that through this man, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And in Hebrews nine verse fifteen, and for this reason he is the mediator, talking about Jesus here. 
He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who were called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So, you know, Moses and Elijah realized that, uh, and, and I don't know if they realized it, I certainly didn't realize it at the time, but they did realize that what Jesus was about to, to do uh, in Jerusalem in, in the upcoming events would affect everything that they had done. That, that no one, even those under the Old Testament, we, as we read here, could not have been saved if Christ had not done what he did. And that's, that's and I think that's very important. And sometimes I think we forget that. That, you know, even, even though if you read in the Old Testament, there's a certainty that events would happen and that they would be saved, but there, there's all before they ever happen, he even can plan things before they ever happen. He knew this was going to happen, so he knew that they would they would be saved. The writer in Hebrews, he's looking back. He's looking at the high priests and the tabernacles and the blood of bulls and goats. And in uh, Hebrews ten four, it tells us that the blood of the bulls and goats could not save them. It took Jesus Christ for the redemption of the transgressions under under the old covenant also. And then he, he, he goes on while he was, of course, while he was still speaking, uh, behold, a, a bright cloud. Uh, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom. You know, the here and, and that is a, it's, it's a present tense, and as we know in the, in the present tense, Often that is defiled, and it is an active, uh, active voice, and it is, it is the imperative mood. He's telling them, he's commanding them, you need to hear him. Uh, you're no longer to hear the law and the prophets, hear him. Peter tried to put them on the same plane, and God came up and, and uh, straightened them out pretty quickly. You know, the apostles fell down with, with great fear. Uh, you know, th there, there will come a day when we all, uh, in uh, Romans 14, verse 11, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And, and that's a, that comes out of the Old Testament, Isaiah uh, chapter 45, verse 23. Jesus told them, as, as that cloud came over, and he's, He's telling them, you hear him. Uh, Jesus be afraid. And I know Peter and his uh, apostles had heard that phrase before, just recently, but they had, they had heard it. They, they all, in verse 8, it talks about they had only, this is uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. That's all we need is, is, is Jesus only. It says, uh, I, don't, I don't remember who's, uh, I had read this somewhere, it said, we need redemption, God gave us Jesus. We need forgiveness, God gave us Jesus. We need grace, and God gave us Jesus. That's all we need is Jesus, and that's all they saw. You know, a lot, uh, in the early days, when you, when you read through, especially through Galatians, uh, well, through the remainder of the New Testament, the... Uh, Often the Jews wanted to bring the law of Moses into it. They wanted to bring the prophets into it. But all they needed was Jesus. You know, and, and he goes on in, in uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. And when they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. You know, Jesus didn't want it to want them to tell of this event until after he had risen from the dead. Uh, in, in Mark's account, in Mark 9, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 10, he, he, he says that the apostles questioned what the rising from the dead meant. Uh, because, and Jesus had told them many times that he would, you know, that he would die and be, resur be resurrected. Every time Jesus told them that he was going to Jerusalem to die, he mentioned the resurrection, but it, it's like it didn't really sink in until after he had risen from the dead. It's, it's, uh, and, and you know, 
they have seen Jesus raise people from the dead. It's kind of, you know, and I, and, I, and I say, well, if I was in the same place, would I have realized that too? Or would I have been just like them and, and not understood? And I, and I don't know because I wasn't there. Of course, we have the rest of the story. So, so we do know that he, he rose from the dead, and we do know that that was what he was talking about. But, uh, you know, the, 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 as, he, as he comes on down, uh, you know, Jesus, well, Jesus was ready. He didn't, he didn't want them to tell anyone of what was going to happen. I know Jesus was ready. Uh, he was sinless, but I, I don't think his apostles were ready. And I don't think that the, the, the timing was just not right. I know we had studied a few weeks ago that, that the reason he didn't want them to tell that he was Christ was because of Old Testament prophecy. I don't, I don't really know why he did not want them to, to uh, reveal that he had been transfigured here and that God had spoken. I, I kind of believe it was because if, if the uh, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees had known about it, of course, speculation on my part, they, they would have gone ahead and tried to kill him. And, and he did not want that. And they asked, his apostles asked, or Peter, James, and, and John asked in verse 10, and his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we had studied about the, uh, the leaven and, and, and beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And this, is, this just goes a little bit further to kind of confirm what Jesus was talking about. Because, and, and as we study even then, the, the apostles or his disciples had kind of fallen into that trap. They were listening to what the scribes and the Pharisees had said. Even, even here, though, they were, uh, it, was, it was something that, that was going to happen. And this comes from a... Uh, you know, and, and, and you kind of wonder why do they ask that, that Elijah must come first. They had just seen Elijah, and they were trying to make a connection with the Old Testament prophecy. Malachi uh, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet after the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. That, that was most likely the Old Testament prophecy that they were referring back to. And he goes on in, uh, in verses 11 and 12, Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know, they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. You know, the, the, uh, you know, Elijah is coming and, and, and has. And it, it, uh, to me, it's, it's a little bit confusing. I'm not, uh, maybe some of y'all will have an idea. It, you know, it seem, seems like Jesus is using uh, future tense and past tense. He, he says that Elijah truly is coming. And, and then he says that Elijah has come already. So he's, he's, he's using some future and past tense in those two verses. And it, I'm not easy to confuse, but it does confuse me just a little bit about uh, why he says he is coming and he, he has come. Uh, Elijah is coming and has already came, but they, they, they could not figure out the scripture enough to know that it was him speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, and they did to him whatever they wished. They killed him. And, and what they certainly couldn't understand the scriptures concerning the Christ and, and what they would do to him and what they were going to do to him was the same thing. They would also also kill him. And that's what he says, likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And I'm sure his, his uh, uh, Peter, James, and, uh, Peter, James, and John did not understand that, exactly what he was talking about, about there either. But it says in verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Any comments or questions? Or? Okay, let's move on to the next uh, next section. Was and the King James calls it a lunatic sign. Uh, the the uh, 
Greek word means moonstruck. I'm not, I'm not sure what moonstruck means, uh, but he, he, he was crazy. The son was crazy. This font's a little bit bigger, but I know you, uh, if you've got a Bible, just follow along if you can't read what's on, up, on the, uh, up on the screen. But the, uh, we'll, we'll read verses the 14 through 21. This is Matthew chapter 17. And then they had come to the multitude, a man saying to him, kneeling down to him, saying, uh, let me back up. The man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic that can suffer severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and he came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said to him, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21, however, this kind, and apparently it was different than the other kinds that they had cast out. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. You know, the, uh, Mark gives a, a lot more detail of this account than, than what we have here. Uh, it, well, he, he, he tells a, a, a lot more about it. He talks about the crowd gathering and the scribes. The scribes were there, and they were accusing the, the uh, disciples of not being able to cast out the cast out the demons. Well, you know, but you know they couldn't cast them out either. Uh, and, and Jesus asked, "What was going on?" And I think in Mark's account, he, he asked, "Why are you questioning him, them?" And, and I'm, I'm assuming from that that they are that he's addressing that comment to the scribes. Because you never hear a word out of him, they never they never respond to anything, and I'm wondering if they they understood that Jesus knew what they were doing, and and uh, he kind of he kind of shut them down uh, fairly quickly because they never they never said anything, and the, and the man with the with the son with epilepsy or the, the lunatic son, he tells Jesus that he had brought his son to the disciples, but they could not heal him. Uh, and we know that they had the power to heal back in Matthew 10, uh, verse 1. They talked about uh, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. But, but they couldn't cure this young man. And, and maybe their faith had diminished somewhat. Uh, Jesus, Jesus does tell them when they come to him privately. And he asked them, it was because of your unbelief or lack of faith. Uh, maybe their faith, uh, you know, you would think their faith would have been increasing all along with what they had been seeing over over the over the uh, several months, but but it had been it had been uh, diminishing, and, and what Jesus is commenting to them is uh, kind of reflects that. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. He, he appears, Jesus in, that, in this account appears to be speaking to the entire, to the entire crowd. Uh, because I, 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 wouldn't have, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't think he would be calling his own uh, disciples perverse. Uh, the, the, but the faithlessness had probably, uh, it, it was probably addressed to his apostles. And the apostles, again, they had been warned about the uh, leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. And, I, and I, th I think that's probably what had been taken some of the toll on them. And he put, appears here to be, Jesus appears here to be a little bit put out with his, with his apostles. You know, he's, he's only going to be on the earth with them, talking to them and training to them. 
for uh, a little over six months. So, you know, he's he's uh, probably a little bit exasperated about how much he's got to do in in those few short months that he has before he is uh, before he is murdered. And in Mark nine verses twenty three and twenty four, uh, Jesus said to him, "If you can believe, talking to the Father, uh, all things are possible with him who believes." Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, "Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief." So, you know, it almost seems like here that some of the the healing has to do with with you know, and it couldn't have been the son. He's not talking to the son here. He's talking to the father, but it, it does appear that some of the healing has to do with the uh, belief of the one, not only the one who the healing has done too, which it wouldn't apply to this case, but but someone who would benefit from that power. And the father had faith, but but he was afraid that it was not enough, and he asked him to to uh, help my unbelief. But in, in uh, verse eighteen, it talks about that it was a demon. Jesus rebuked it. It came out and the child was cured. Uh, so again, all Jesus had to do, as we've studied throughout the last quarter and this quarter, all Jesus had to do was speak. He just had to rebuke the demon and it came out and, and, and he was cured. And then, and then the uh, and then the disciples came to Jesus privately and, and, they, and they asked him they asked him, uh, why could we not cast him out? So, so I don't know if they were a little bit ashamed is the reason that they that they came to him privately. Maybe didn't want to put him on the spot. Or, or uh, I can imagine if it was me, I can imagine that I would have been a little bit ashamed of, of uh, why I couldn't cast him out. And, and so he, he came to him and, and, and they asked Jesus. They were concerned with their inability to cast out the demon. So they came and asked Jesus. And uh, I know Franklin Camp in his book, he talks about this is a good thing. They knew that there was something lacking in them. And they were going to come to, they came to Jesus and asked him why, that they, why they could not uh, cast him out. And Jesus told them if they had, had faith in his, the size of a grain of mustard seed. And we studied about the, the uh, mustard seed, the parable of the mustard seed a while back, and, and talk about how small it is. It's, uh, uh, I know West Graham has a necklace with it on, in, one in it, and it's, I never had seen one until she showed it to me, but it's, I can't really, it's kind of almost like a grain of sand. It's, it is so small. And if they had faith, just that much faith, they would have been able to cast him out. And this demon, uh, it, again, it must have been. Uh, one that they were not used to seeing because Jesus does call it in Mark's count, does call it this kind. And, and he, he talks about this kind. Uh, and then in verse 21, he mentions, well, he, he talks about it in 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so you can see that what the cure for their lack of faith was. It was prayer and fasting. And I know we studied back in in uh, Matthew 6, we studied about when you fast, when you pray. Of course, in, in those in those verses on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, fasting is not, a, it's not an imperative in, in those verses. It is not something that, that God commands us to do. But there does seem to be an expectation that we are to be fasting. And I, and I I'll confess, I don't fast. I kind of kid around, tell people when I fast at night and I break the fast in the morning. But I don't, I don't fast. Uh, of course, uh, my eating habits are terrible. I don't. Uh, I probably spend a total. I don't know. Maybe now days, if I spend thirty minutes eating all three meals, that's that's a lot because I usually grab some on the way out the door in the morning, and at lunch I eat at my desk and answer emails. And, and in the evenings, you know, sometimes Kay and I will sit down in the evenings to eat. But I, I would not say a lot. I, I know it's, it's probably helpful that you do take time to sit down and not uh, go, go ahead, please. Yeah.
does, and, and I think Reggie had mentioned this back in, in uh, Matthew 6 when we were studying about it. It's not an imperative, but there does seem to be an expectation that we're expected to fast. And you can read, I, I started writing down and thought I'd probably get off topic. But, and, and I love computers nowadays because you can sort through the scriptures so quickly and just read how many times, you know, Peter and Paul, how many times they would fast. In, in their in their daily walk, and if it's you know if it's something that they did, it's probably something we shouldn't be doing. But it's separate part of whether it's an expectation or whether it's a command that's asked to talk about this. Um, what it does, I believe, uh, like when Jesus was uh, uh, before he was tempted, when there's three uh, stages in the Matthew's story, he uh, it helps us get control. Some translation I was reading through, I don't, I don't, it's not my Bible. That verse is in the Bible that I use, the Nelson New King James. Yeah, and, and it's not in the earlier man, manuscripts. Uh, now, Mark's account, in, in Mark chapter 9, he mentions prayer. This comes by prayer, and he doesn't say anything about fasting. So that, that I'm wondering if some of that maybe came from you know, because it's not in the early manuscripts, and that tells me it's, if it's not in the early manuscripts, it shouldn't be in there, but because uh, someone added it at a later date. Now, Mark does in his account, if you go read it in chapter 9, he does uh, mention that, that it comes by prayer. He does not say fasting. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, the next section uh, will be verses 22 and 23. And Wes isn't here to see the font got bigger. So uh, I finally got one right and I wanted him to see it, but he's not in here. So, uh, but here Jesus is, is again, he's, he's reminding them of uh, his upcoming death. And in uh, verse 22 and 23, this is in Matthew chapter uh, 17. Now when, they were set, now when they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. The, uh, you know, this this is the this is the third time that Jesus has told his apostles uh, that, that he has, has attempted to prepare his apostles for what was coming up. Uh, you know, he he had told them back in in uh, Matthew sixteen verse, verses verses. Uh, 21, and, and Peter had rebuked him back in Matthew 17, verse 9. It says they were sorrowful. Now Mark and Luke, in their account, they indicate that the apostles did not understand what Jesus was talking about, but they were afraid to ask. So he, he uh, you know, it says they were sorrowful, but, but they, again, they did not understand. The kingdom and the death did not go hand in hand. Peter had just received the keys of the kingdom. He's, I, I don't know if he understood what that meant, but, but Jesus dying didn't fit that narrative. And, 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 but it, it 
did say that they were were sorrowful. And Jesus did reveal something new here. He did reveal that he would be betrayed. This was something that he had not revealed to them before. Uh, and one day they will remember his words and they will marvel. Uh, and, and I think when Peter went into the tomb and they saw everything was out, when he came out of the tomb in Luke uh, 24, I think it's verse 10, I've got 11 written down here, but I think that's wrong. When he came out, he marveled at, at what had was happening. If you, if you do a search on that word in the Bible, it's always accompanying some kind of a miraculous event. That, that, it, that, it, that it just happened. And so when Peter walked into that tomb and saw what had happened when he came out, I think at that time he, he, he understood then what Jesus was talking about. Going on to the next part, the uh, last part of this chapter, uh, verses 24 through 27. And when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And he said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their own excuse me, from their own sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, From strangers. And Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes out first. And when you have opened his mouth, you shall find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. You know, it makes me wonder, did, did, uh, when Peter said yes, did he really know if, if Jesus had paid that tax? This was not a Roman tax. This was a temple tax. It was a tax that the Jews used for the temple. Of course, we know the temple was for God. And that, that uh, is what really brings up, uh, brings up Jesus' comment to him. And there was some dispute. I know McGarvey says in his commentary there was some dispute between the Pharisees and the Sadducees on whether this tax was voluntary or if it was mandatory. And so we really, we really don't know uh, because there was a little bit of confusion there. You know, the, the, in verse 24, they didn't, they didn't ask uh, they asked Peter, does your teacher? They didn't ask Peter if he paid it. You know, a lot of times the scribes and the Pharisees were accusing not Jesus, they were accusing his disciples. But, but when they asked this question here, they, they didn't ask uh, did Peter pay the temple tax. They asked, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And their, and their, their uh, conversation, it ties back to what Peter it said in, in uh, Matthew 16, verse uh, 14 through 16, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Uh, you know, and Peter had also heard uh, just, just recently on the transfiguration that, you know, he had heard God declare, this is his son, whom he is well pleased. And so that, that kind of is what brings out the response that, uh, that Jesus has to Peter. Peter doesn't even go in and tell him about it. It says that Jesus anticipated. And, and he asked him from whom do the kings of the earth takes custom of taxes uh, from their own sons or from strangers. And, and not meaning strangers as in Gentiles, but meaning people that were not their sons. And, and you know, Peter's answer to him was from the strangers. And so, you know, what, what Jesus is coming back to Peter was then the sons are free and they, they wouldn't take taxes from the from the sons they would only take taxes from from those who are not the sons and, and because the temple tax went to God those tributes were paid to God and not to man uh, they wouldn't come from God but Jesus uses you know a miracle to pay the taxes he uh, he, he tells Peter to go cast a hook in the water take the first fish that comes up and, and uh, go pay the taxes not only for him but he also covered, covered Peter on that. I, I think I'm out of time, but uh, next week we'll just start, uh, start reading chapter 18. And uh, I do appreciate your comments and your attention. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm obviously not Chuck. He's at home sick, and I know he'd rather be here. But uh, filling in in his absence, uh, I'm glad to do. As we think about the theme uh, that this congregation has adopted for the next year, love God, love people, and change the world. You know, this is really only a slogan if we don't embrace what it means and if we don't embrace how we live it out in our lives, both individually and collectively as a congregation. If we're able to do great things for the Lord, we must be joined together and be united in our effort to do so. This morning, we'll be looking at God's desire for unity among his children. We'll discuss the basis of Christian unity from God's word. As we go into this new year, let's strive to demonstrate that there's even a greater unity among us than maybe has existed even in the past. When we show our love for God and we show through our deeds that we love people, we can go about our daily lives and doing those things get, that can make changes in our little part of the world. Collectively, as we do those small things individually, we can make big changes in the world around us. Let's take a moment now to reflect upon God's love for us, our love for one another, and our desire to make a difference in the world. Let's take a moment of silence.
Father, we're so thankful that you've brought us here, that you've made us a part of your kingdom, a part of your family. And now, Father, as we enter into this worship service today, uh, let us join our voices together. Let us praise you with all the fiber of our being. And, Father, let us uh, develop even a stronger zeal to love you, to love one another, to love the world round about us, and go about doing those things that we can do to make changes in the world in which we live, the world in which you made for us to enjoy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all be standing for this morning's scripture reading. The scripture reading this morning will be uh, Psalm 133, all three verses of Psalm 133. And it reads, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Good morning to all of you. It's so good to see you here this morning. And uh, we're singing 121 for our first song, 121. <clears throat> Let's sing all three verses. Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Seventy-nine. We'll sing all four verses. Sing it very softly.
Almighty God, we begin by uh, recognizing you and acknowledging you as our God, uh, the creator of the universe, all that we see, all that we know. Uh, we know that you hold it all in your hand, and without you, there would be nothing. Um, and yet, in the midst of all that, Father, you, you chose to create us, and we, it's, it's a humbling thought. Um, that uh, that you, being the Almighty, uh, took the time to to make each ep- each one of us individually and to to care for us, um, to cultivate us, and love us enough to uh, send your Son Jesus to this earth um, to to live and then to die for us. Father, as we move into this new year, we just pray that we can. Keep, keep that in mind uh, each and every day, particularly as we strive to live out our, our theme for this year, to love you more, uh, to love others more, and to, through doing each of those things, to change the world. We just pray that you would help us each and every day uh, to, to focus on, on those things, Father, and as we do, that in fact uh, the, the world will be changed, um, especially here locally in this community, but but also outside of that community and the other, other efforts that go on. Um, Father, there are, uh, there are many in this congregation that, that are sick, Father. Um, we just pray uh, for all those in the care lines um, and then others that, that aren't ne- directly mentioned there, Father. We know that, that you're aware of these situations. Um, and we ask that your, your comforting hand can be on each and every one of them. Father, we pray for the leadership of this congregation, the elders and their families, that you would um, continue to uh, guide them, provide them with with wisdom as they lead the flock here, Um, be with uh, the deacons, um, the ministry leaders, um, the teachers of the classes, and and everybody who is uh, working here, Father, that you would continue to um, bless them and bless the efforts that go on here. Um, Father, as we continue... In worship to you, Father, we just pray that we can do so reverently and and worshipfully, um, that we would um, give you the praise and the the honor and the glory that you deserve. We ask all these things in your Son's name. Amen. We'll sing 350 now. This will help our minds prepare for the Lord's Supper, and I'd like for us to sing all verses of this song together. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for
when Vicki and I were raising our two boys, one of the wonderful times that we had together was coming together for a meal. Vicki was a great cook. We always had a good breakfast, a good lunch, and a good dinner. And coming together for a meal was special. It was the time before smartphones. Look around your table today and watch and see how many people are on their smartphones when you're coming together for a meal. It was a time before there was a TV in the kitchen. We had one TV back then in the living room, a little 13-inch black and white. Kids today don't even understand that. But mealtime was special. And mealtime for the family of God is right now, and it's special. It's a time we can come together. We love one another. We're unified. We're going to concentrate on what is before us. Ephesians 4, 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And in 2 Peter Chapter 1, starting in verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we're so grateful for this meal time, a time to come together to remember what Christ has done for us, a time to partake of this bread that represents his body that was hung on the cross for our sins, a time to remember that sacrifice that was given on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, we realize that the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that takes our sins away. What a tremendous thought to think that you will never remember our sins anymore against us. That the blood of Jesus that we have come in contact with through our baptism has washed those sins completely away, never to be remembered again. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we remember that blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. directed that at this time we have purposed in our hearts and set aside a portion of our blessings to give back to him. Let us pray. Father, we live in such a blessed land and so we're so thankful for everything you've bestowed upon us. You've richly given us all things and for this we're thankful. Father, help us to have looked into our hearts and purpose to give back to you at this time a portion of those blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
would mark in your books for the invitation song will be 904. 904. And we want to sing two songs before the lesson this morning. The first will be 704. 704. And we'll sing this song through twice. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. will be 448, 448. Let me ask you to please stand as we sing this song together.
we're so happy that you're here this morning. And if you're visiting with us, we are especially glad that you're here. We count you our honored guest, and we hope that you will find everything that is done will be done in accordance with the glory of God. As we think about the idea of living in unity and peace together, I think it's incumbent upon us to go to God's Word. We're reminded in Scripture, in John chapter 7, where we see Jesus himself praying that his followers would be one. He said he prayed that we would be one even as he and the Father are one. He said that we are to be one, that we are to be united in purpose, and we are to be united in heart. As we gather here today, there is indeed a desire on the part of each one of us to attain to something that is better than what we find here on this earth. In our hearts, we know that we want the promises of that eternal home with him in heaven. We know that we also uh, have demands placed upon us during this life. And among those demands is our desire to live in peace and harmony with one another. Unity can be found in many different causes, of course. Members of the military are bound together in their desire to defeat their enemy. We might find people united behind a political cause or maybe even a political candidate. We can find some measure of unity as we uh, support a, an athletic team. During every four-year period when the Olympics is held, we're all united behind those who wear the colors of our nation. But unity that comes from any of these things is fleeting. It doesn't last. Politicians come and politicians go. Causes fade over time. And given a little time, the unity that is associated with those things will also fade and fracture. Nations that once were enemies are now close allies. Nations that once were allies are now adversaries. Unity on any basis other than the cause of Christ is destined to fade over time. True unity brings peace and not conflict. Where there is no peace, there can be no unity. Living in peace then means that we look beyond our obvious differences and we focus on those things that are truly important. Think for a moment of the majesty of God's kingdom. As we are gathered here today to worship God, we are in a family that has done so already on the opposite part of the world and will do so later today in other parts of the world. Isn't that magnificent? We think about the true peace and the true unity that we find in the body of Christ, but we find that true unity not in our nationality, not in our ethnicity, not in our racial makeup, not in the color of our skin, but it is the unity of our common faith. True unity, then, has nothing to do with speaking a common language, has nothing to do with those things that are external. True unity is to be found only through our common adoption as children into the kingdom of God. I think it's no doubt those thoughts that David had in mind when he penned this beautiful song. As was read before us, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to, to dwell together in unity. It is, he says, like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts or the hem of his garments. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, 
For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. This psalm is considered one of the pilgrim psalms, written mostly by David. This is a psalm that would be recited by those who are journeying to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, the festivals, the sacrifices that were commanded under the law of Moses. And it is no doubt that celebration that David sees, that spectacle that unfolded before him as he penned the words of this psalm. Behold, David says, as he begins this, he says this as if he's summoning someone to come and to look at what he himself is seeing. David, I don't believe, is looking upon this as a national event. The unity that we have is in our joint citizenship in the kingdom of God. It still stands for something today for us to behold as far as the world is concerned. With so much animosity and conflict in the world between people, how can we as Christians of all nations and all races dwell together in peace and in harmony? David is likely seeing the get this gathering of Jewish people in Jerusalem for these various feasts and observances that were part of the regular religious practices of his day. But he knows that the unity that he speaks of is found in their faith in Almighty God. The thought that is expressed by David is that the sight of Israel gathered together to worship God is a good thing, with many benefits coming from it. He said it is pleasant. Thayer defines the word good as to work good, to do good, to do well, to act rightly. It seems in this passage that the definition of act rightly seems to fit this context. The assembly of God's people to worship is good, and in so doing, they acted rightly. Pleasant is used as, defined as delightful or sweet. It reminds us, I believe, of the symbolism of Revelation chapter 8. Where there it is said that the prayers of the saints are mixed together with the incense that were burned by the angel. And that, that incense mixed with the prayers of the saints goes up to God as a sweet-smelling savor, even in the nostrils of the very God of heaven. No doubt David saw the sweetness of their worship, and he called it pleasant. This unity, he says, is like the precious ointment like the view of Heron, uh, Hebron. Taken together, these images would connote an importance for God's people because these images are in the category of what David calls good and pleasant. These symbols, when we take them together, represent the blessings that flow out from God and come in accord to David as he sees his people gathered together. The anointing ointment that is poured on Aaron's head likely represents the spirit of agreement on, on the part of the brethren. David sees this oil as running down, even over his beard, over his garment, even to the hem of the very garments, and he sees that as good and pleasant. It is as all-encompassing for the nation of Israel. In David's poem, it extends to all of these faithful worshipers. Likewise, the dew of Heron falls to Mount Zion. The idea of falling or running down taken together would provide a, a likely intent of David in using the analogies. The benefits of the dew are seen even to Mount Zion. Dew would provide life-giving moisture to the desert land of that area. Similarly, as we think about David's what he sees, he, he, he sees that this dew provides life-giving quality to the faithful of God. It represents the blessings of God as they flow down to Israel when they are faithful in keeping covenant with God. When we think about unity, it might be good for us to identify what unity is not. 
David is not seeing unity as being limited to those of the nation of Israel, united in the same government, in subjection to the same earthly king. Neither does he consider unity to be between brethren in a natural state, that is, of the same family, of the same tribe. Unity is not merely the absence of conflict. We know that from Genesis chapter 13. When we see the conflict that arose between Abraham and his servants and Lot and his servants, and we know the resolution to that conflict was one of separation. Well, that separation may have brought some measure of peace, but it did not bring unity between Abraham and his herdsmen and Lot and his herdsmen. You find Moses having to be separated from his people because of conflict, but yet there was no peace. So there's no unity. True unity is a holy thing. It's motivated by our love for God and for our love for one another. For David, this spiritual unity was found in the sight of the Israelites coming together to worship at Jerusalem. And it was more important than that, the national unity of the nation of Israel. It's a celebration of the common life of faith that binds God's people together. The thing that attracted David's attention was the spiritual bonds of heavenly fellowship that are enjoyed by those who gather together to worship their common God. This common expression is the united Christian life is illustrated for us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We see there where he describes the church as a living organism. He compares it to the body, our own body. He says in verses 12 through 27, I'll dip into a couple of verses, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. We come together as 300 plus, but we're assembled together as one. He says that we are in one spirit, all baptized into one body. We're all made to drink of that one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. There are many parts, he says, but one body. And the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable to the whole. And he, pray, he prays and encourages them that there be no division in the body, that the members may be of the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Did you catch that? You are the body of Christ and individually, individually members of it. Just as the members of the human body have no existence apart from the whole body, Individual believers can have no existence independent of the body of Christ. You can't live as a Christian apart from the body of Christ. We need one another to be the whole body. When one part is hurting and one part is missing, the body is not whole. Individually, we need one another. Peter added to this teaching with the analogy of a building. He said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, you yourselves like living stones are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the unity that God wants. The unity that is to be found in the family of God. To use Peter's analogy of the of the church as a building, we see the whole building is dependent upon each living stone. There are no unimportant stones. We're all to bear the weight according to our ability to bear it. 
Jesus makes it clear that unity among believers is possible only through our mutual love for one another. Without a love for one another, there can be no unity. We can't love in word only, however. We must allow our actions to match our words. Jesus tells us in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 5, a passage so familiar to all of you. A new commandment I give you, Jesus says, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, he says, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. The result of that mutual love is unity. The result of that mutual love is peace and harmony amongst God's people. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed that they may all be one just as you Father and I are one. This unity then is brought about through our mutual love. That love that brings a oneness in our teaching, that is our doctrine, but more importantly, or equally as important, I guess I should say, the unity in our hearts, the unity of spirit. Paul implored the, the Corinthian brethren to strive for that spiritual unity. Where in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, I appeal. That is a strong, I appeal, I implore, I beg you, brethren, in the name of Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no division, that you be united in the same spirit and the same judgment. If we love one another, we will desire to have that kind of peace. That kind of peace as we live together. Paul, uh, uh, Paul said in Romans that if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We can't control what others do. We can only control what we do. So to the extent that it is possible, let us live in peace and harmony with the world round about us. When we seek for peace, People will notice. Mark chapter 9 tells, tells us that we are salt. And he says we are to have salt in ourselves and be at peace with one another. Our love doesn't mean that there will never be a disagreement. Paul and Barnabas encountered a disagreement or two along the way. But we found a beautiful example in Acts chapter 15 of how those disagreements, the doctrinal disagreement that occurred during the first century were handled. And we can see there, if we read chapter 15 of the book of Acts, how they came together in a spirit of mutual respect and resolved what differences there were. Conclusions were made and uh, letters written and, and peace would reign for a time. The Hebrew writer tells us in 13 and 1, let brotherly love continue. We could add, let it continue still today. Our relationship with one another is based on that brotherly love. The love that we would have for our own brother, and I think the fact is many times, the relationships that we have with our Christian families is stronger than the relationships we have sometimes with our physical families. True unity is to be found in the Lord. When we learn his word, when we apply it to our lives, and we live in accordance with his instructions, unity will be the result. Isaiah speaks to us about a day in the future to him when Christ would bring unity and peace to this earth. That day was in the future to Isaiah, but it's the present age to us as we live to get today in the kingdom that was promised. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, he tells us, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that day the root of, Je of Jesse shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Peace is meant to reign in God's kingdom. 
The foundation of unity among believers is the recognition that we exist as a part of his kingdom, his church, and not our own. Since the church belongs to God and Christ is its head, he sets the standards that are to be applied. Our part is simply to do his will. Jeremiah says, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way. But note the order in Jeremiah. He says, First, the faithful will be God's people, a people of one heart and one way. If they are God's people, as evidenced by the unity that they show, then he will be their God. This is God's message to his people today. If we're faithful to him, he will lift us up. He will adopt us as children. Unity can come only through each of us living out our calling in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 reminds us that we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which we're called. Philippians tells us that we are to be of the same mind, that we are to have the same love, that we are to be in full accord, that we are to be of one mind, that we are to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility we are to count others more significant than ourselves. He says we are to look not to our own interest only, but also to the interest of others. John reminds us that we know that we pass from death to life when we love the brethren. He says when we know that we love God and love one another, he says by this we can know we can know that we are in God. Now, there's many blessings that we see that come from unity. In that passage from Ephesians chapter 4, going down to verse 2 through 6, we see that these are the blessings that come from living a life of peace and harmony and unity. Being joined together with one purpose and one goal. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you're called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. With unity, we find, comes humility. With unity, we find, comes humility gentleness. With unity, we find, comes forbearance or patience with one another. With unity, we find, comes peace. All these things are brought about because the Spirit brings about unity. Christians are to be united together in the bonds of peace. We do a harm to the cause of Christ when we allow discord or disharmony to come between us. And Peter agreed with Paul in the importance of those fruits of the fruits of the Spirit when he said in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 that we are to have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, an humble mind. And with unity comes hope. If we live our lives according to the calling in which we're called, if we exhibit that humility, that gentleness, that patience, that forbearance. And since Paul and Peter uh, wrote about those things to remind us of the importance of them, we should follow them. If we follow the word of God as the Holy Spirit taught them, and we follow that word in our lives today, he will continue to teach us as we study the scriptures. We too can experience the hope that is found in that one Lord, that one faith, that one baptism, that one God, and that one Father of us all. We can know that unity and that peace even today. We can have a life of peace. We can see that there are those round about us all the time 
every day, whether it's in a grocery store, our place of work, just driving on the highway, we see those people who have no peace. There are those people that we encounter that it's more like uh, encountering a construction zone than, than peace and harmony. Let us not be like them. Let's be those that bring the salving peace to this world. As we think about our theme for this year, we love God. We show our love for God by how we treat our fellow man. And as we show our love for God and our love for our fellow man in the actions of our daily life and our daily interactions with others, we can demonstrate God's love to them. We can be different than what they see every day. We can do something that causes someone to stop for just a moment and recognize, you know, there's something different about that person. I'd like to learn more about what it is that brings the peace in their life. Peace and contentment comes only from Jesus. Peace and contentment comes only through our living a life in harmony with God's Word. But you can't live a life in harmony with God's Word. You can't live a life in peace with God if you're not in Christ. And to be in Christ, you are part of His kingdom, you're part of His church. And if you've never made that decision to be part of the kingdom of God, if you've never decided to accept the grace that God has extended to you, there's no better time than today to do that so that you would have the opportunity to live in peace and harmony with God and with your fellow man. And if you're having struggles as a child of God, struggles with your own internal peace, there's no better place to turn than to your brothers and sisters and ask for the prayers and the comfort that can come only from people of God. If you're subject to the invitation, we ask that you come even now as we stand and sing this song for your encouragement. Into Jesus, the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you holy?
We're delighted to have the opportunity this morning to witness Eli's baptism, his, uh, his adoption into the family of God is consummated through this, 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 this baptism. Uh, someone will help us. We will, we will do that. We're going to, Dad's going to take care of that, that chore, and uh, we were invited to all stay and be a part of that. Let's sing 683. 683. I'm mine no more.
very special time in a man's life when he gets the opportunity to baptize his son. And this is, uh, this is a very special time, both for father and son. I'm going to take uh, Eli's confession from here, because there's no place for me to stand up there. to welcome everyone out to the morning services this morning to Uber Church of Christ. If you haven't had a chance to pick up a bulletin, please do so before you leave. There's a lot of good information in it, most of which I will not touch on because it's pretty lengthy. But uh, this afternoon, just a few points for current events. This afternoon, the Devo at the HEPA 3 starts back. Uh, it'll be 3.30 until 4.30. There are... Uh, there are a lot of announcements concerning last to leaders in the bulletin, so uh, please take a note of those. And we're starting something kind of new here this week. I think it's every, will it be every second week, Daryl? Or, okay, but the, uh, on Wednesday afternoons from 3.30 until church starts, there'll be someone up here. It's, it's just after school on Wednesday. Uh, if you can't get here at 3.30, just get here when you can, and, and there will be someone up here. And this is for the 6th grade through the 12th grade. A couple of announcements that aren't in the bulletin. The, uh, there will be a gospel meeting starting this month on, on the 19th. It will go from 19th through the 21st. Dale Jenkins will be the speaker for that. And then also, uh, Joel had texted me, uh, there's a... Uh, if you are participating in Bible Bowl, next week for Bible Bowl, you will have a, he calls it a team placement test, next Sunday at, starting at 145. He said the chapters that will be covered will be, uh, it will be 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 10. So if you haven't been studying, you might want to start. So, And uh, I do appreciate everyone that took care of the uh, I don't, I don't know if we were having a lesson on the flood down the hall this past week, but we do appreciate everyone that took care of that, and, and I just thank you for that. Thanks. What a wonderful morning we've had here. Chuck, we miss you, brother. We miss you. We hope you get well soon. Our closing song, 122. 122, and we'll sing the first verse of this song, and then we'll be led in our closing prayer. Would you please stand as we sing? Since the love of God has shed, precious blessings on my head, I have been.
Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we come humbly before thy throne. We offer many thanks to you. We're thankful for this day. We're blessed and thankful for Eli and his decision to become a Christian. We're thankful for the lessons that were taught this morning. May each of us examine those lessons and apply them to our lives. We pray that individually you give us strength and wisdom and patience and understanding as we collectively come together in unity. Please be with those that have lost loved ones. Please comfort them in a way that only you can. Please be with those that are on our hearts and minds and that are on our care lines that are struggling with health issues. And please restore their health back to them if it be thy will. Please forgive us of our sins as we strive to become better Christians. We're thankful for you sending Jesus to die for our sins, and it's through his name we pray. Amen.